Good afternoon, QA engineers and those who are planning to become one soon. Within the last several months, our students have been getting job offers pretty much on a weekly, I would even say in, on some weeks, even on a daily basis. And I've decided to update a list of questions that they have been getting before they actually got a job. And one of them got a job last week and she got these questions that I'm about to share with you. And those were for the QA automation engineer position. Although quite a few of them were situational, were story-based, were behavioral, and also technical. And I will share those questions with you and answer them from my perspective of the person. Let me actually tell you who I am, and then we're gonna get started. My name is Sergey Krumchenko, and I'm a software QA engineer, lead manager, and a senior engineering manager of SDAT in the past. But these days, I'm helping people like you to become an engineer from scratch or to improve your existing skills. Now, let's get started. Alrighty, the very first question is, can you introduce yourself or tell me about yourself? I'm not going to waste your time, I have a video for you right here. And I did answer that question within about 10 minutes in the best way possible. So make sure to check it out and I'm going to move forward to the next question. Tell me about a time when you made an extra effort to achieve a milestone. Once upon a time, I did get a task from my manager to build a test infrastructure for our entire team. And I've never done it before. That is usually done by DevOps team because building a test infrastructure, meaning you have to know AWS quite well. You have to know CI CD, which you can do, you can be involved into it as the QA engineer or an SDAT, but working with with AWS, with the Docker, etc. Most of the time, building infrastructure will be done by DevOps. But anyways, I did take on this challenge and it took me three months to build an entire infrastructure. And once upon, actually a couple of times, I had to stay up to 2 a.m. in order to get through the challenges that I had in terms of AWS, because even when I would ask questions, my DevOps or DevOps from our company, they would not be able to answer my questions. Once upon a time, they said, hey, you know what? You got that far that I have no idea how to, how to help you right now. You're gonna have to figure it out on your own. So that was my extra effort. And within three months, I built a new test infrastructure for my team. And that test infrastructure have made a significant impact on our company, which means before we had 400 tests that ran within 50 minutes. After I've built this infrastructure on AWS, we were able to run 1,000 tests, guess in how many minutes? In eight minutes only. Alrighty, next question. Tell me about a time you inspired someone on your team. By doing that amount of work, I have act I've actually did inspire quite a few people. It was not my intention to make people stay late, but some of the achievers woke up as they saw my example and later on they would message me sometimes 10 to 11 p.m. I'm not saying it's a good thing or it's a bad, bad thing, but I did show an example. I did show how you can build a new test infrastructure, how you can achieve a new milestone very quickly if you spend and if you put in extra effort. And people started following my example afterwards. How do you work under tight deadlines across multiple projects? I think an example with a test infrastructure should have given you an answer as while you're working on multiple projects, number one, you have to prioritize what out of those projects are the most important ones for the business. And you have to simply talk to every single product owner or product manager within that team and including your manager as well because you have a limited amount of work. You need, you need to simply count how much work can you do for each project and prioritize tickets out of each project, which tickets or which priorities would be the most important ones for the business. And from then on, you can ask your manager for extra help in case you cannot get the most important priorities on time or you can spend an extra time in a way I did it. And by the way, some of our subscribers did ask me to help them to improve their English as the majority of us were not born in the US or in English speaking countries. So especially for you guys, I did open up a new YouTube channel called Sergi Speaks and you can find a link for it right below this video. Let's continue. 
what values do you bring to every project you are jumping on? So your values are the things that you are doing the best. The things that can help this or that project, this or that business. Every one of you guys will have a different values and accomplishments. Mine, I, and number one, I'm very technical. Number two, I'm good at communication. So from the technical standpoint, I can bring quite a lot of experience and help improve things, make them faster and make them more efficient. And from the communication perspective, I help to bring teams together. I did work for quite a few companies as the lead and as the manager, and people wanted to come to work. People enjoyed working and spending time together as the team and going through multiple challenges together. So these are the two main values that I can bring from my perspective. And you should think about yours and actually tell me in the comments below, what are your values or accomplishments that you can bring to every single project? All right, moving forward. The next question is going to be technical. Playwright experience, automation that you've been doing. So as the QA engineer, you can say, yeah, definitely I have been working on a test automation. I did create a lot of test cases. I did some integrations. I have integrated Mailosaur which is an email email client that helps software key engineers or ASDATs to programmatically send and receive email addresses in order to test registration. And you can share that experience and based on that experience, they can ask you follow-up questions such as, were you writing test scripts from scratch or modifying them? Majority of students in our bootcamp are creating test automation framework from scratch probably five to 10 times throughout the course. So you can definitely say that you did create test automation framework from scratch and you did update, you did add new test cases, updated existing automation tests. And also you did quite a few integrations, including Mailos, for example, that you have just, or I have just mentioned. What tools do you use mostly on a daily basis? Number one, you definitely use your email. Two, Slack. Three, Jira, because you got to go through tickets. You got to see what needs to be tested. Also, maybe what needs to be automated if you are or your lead creating tickets for yourself. By the way, if you guys are interested in learning how to create your test automation framework from scratch and base learn basics of automation and JavaScript, I do run one week introduction course into world of test automation, where you will be able to spend three live webinars with me or one of our mentors and spend an entire week worth of internship in a US-based startup where you will be writing some test automation for the first time, probably for the first time in your life. So if you are interested, I'm going to leave a link right below this video. And if you're interested to do the same thing in terms of manual testing, I'm also doing one week introduction course in the world of manual testing. The link is right below this video. All right, let's continue. Aside of VS Code, which is a code, a code editor, I'm also using Playwright or Cypress, which are test automation frameworks for UI and API testing. And on the side of that, I'm using Copilot in order to speed up my coding efforts in order to write code much faster. You guys might have a different answer as you're probably, you could probably be working with the different, uh, different AIs that help you to write a code. But we're going to move forward to the next question. What's the difference between JavaScript and a TypeScript? Which one do you prefer and why? JavaScript is a front-end programming language which was created quite a while ago. And in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, or 2009, some guy from the United States did decide to actually help software developers who are only using front-end uh, JavaScript for the front end to also use it for the back end. So he came up with something called Node.js. So whenever you're asking this question, you probably mean Node.js versus TypeScript. And Node.js is a language for the front end and back end based on a JavaScript. Pretty much it's not even a language, it's a runtime environment. And this is going to be a little bit technical. That contains three main things. Number one, it contains JavaScript language. Number two, it contains V8 engine from the Google Chrome browser. And number three, it contains lib, lib UV library from C Sharp, if I'm not mistaken, that allows Node.js to make async calls so that you would be able not to run only JavaScript synchronously the way it was done in the past on the front end, but also asynchronously now on the front end and on the back end. And the TypeScript is pretty much a, we can say a new version or a new branch of the JavaScript 
that was created by Microsoft, which where I'm actually at right now. And a TypeScript is type-oriented uh, or type-specific language compared to JavaScript. So it's pretty much a mix of the JavaScript in Node.js and the C-sharp. So what Microsoft developers did, they took the best from C-sharp, they took the best from the JavaScript, as the JavaScript is still the most popular programming language in the world, and they combine it into a TypeScript. And why do I prefer one or the other one? Both of them are awesome, but TypeScript will catch more adders when you just kick off your code because you will see all of the type-based adders. And JavaScript, you will actually have to run it and get to the point where that code is getting executed. And only then you will see those adder messages. Alrighty, moving forward to the next one. How do you balance between manual and automation testing? Great question, and a lot of companies will do things differently. What I have found that works the best for me is left shift testing. Pretty much, you create your test automation way before you test things manually, before they are even created. And what that means, whenever developers are getting a ticket saying, hey, you should create a login or registration feature or a search feature regardless, you grab those requirements and you create test automation or a couple of automated tests for that particular feature. You don't write test cases for it. You simply write test automation right away. And as soon as feature is available, you simply add those elements to your actual automation code, you run it, and then if there are any issues, you fix them. So by doing that, you will have everything automated before the feature is even created. So you don't even have to worry about test cases, about writing them. That was my experience in uh, several years ago when I worked for one of the enterprise companies in the United States. But anyways, I think this is the most efficient way. But a lot of companies will do manual testing. By the way, it's raining, but regardless. A lot of companies are actually having their QA engineers wait for the build to get into QA environment. And then you would, they would start testing it manually. They would release it. They would write test cases and only then they would automate it. In my opinion, it's not the most effective way. You guys tell me, what do you think? Is it actually effective or not? Anyways, I'm going to move forward. How do you identify which test cases should be automated? Well, very simple. Number one, you should automate those that are most repetitive and those which, uh, which have stable functionality that you are sure that is not going to change soon. For example, if there is a new feature coming out and your team is saying, well, we're not sure we're gonna be, we're gonna keep this feature for a while. We're gonna test it out. So you don't write automation for it. If you're sure that that feature is coming out and it's gonna stay there for good, then you definitely will. If we come back to the previous question where I was talking about a shift left testing, we would automate everything right away. And if you have time for it, that's amazing. You don't even have to worry about things automating and doing things manually because you will have time to automate every single thing if you are efficient enough. But if you're working in a, in a company with the structure that I've described as well, you have to do manual testing and then you do have to, have to do automation testing slowly, little by little. Then you would, you would automate all of your regression tests, number one, because you do run those and they are the most repetitive tasks. I mean, the tasks that you repeat on a daily basis. Then you would automate tasks that it takes you a while to do manually, but you can automate once and forget about them for the rest of your life, unless code breaks. All right, moving forward to the next one. When do you start automation during the development process? From my experience, as I mentioned, you should start it actually when you are, when developer gets the ticket. So you will start automation then. Probably majority of you got used to the fact that you will automate it as soon as you've done that manual testing and you created a test case. The question is, what's more efficient? I've shared my version. You tell me what is your opinion and have you ever done le shift left testing or you can be doing it in a classic way that majority of companies in this world are doing. All right, I don't want to get you guys overwhelmed, but you let me know if you have enjoyed these questions and answers so far and if you would like me to record many more because literally I'm getting this, these lists of questions on a daily basis from our students who are getting job offers. And if you want to see a list of those job offers, how much they're getting, how many applications they had to send in order to get those jobs. I have a video for you right here. 
Thank you for joining, get some water, get some workout and get a really good nap that I'm about to get. I'll see you on the next video.